from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above, you heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good morning, sisters and brothers in Christ. Let us worship God. Will you please stand for the call to worship? This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day of new beginnings. Come, let us prepare ourselves for worship. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite you to repeat with me the prayer that is printed as opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we come this day, having seen the miracles of everyday creation in our world. We have enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the gentle rains. We have marveled over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of your creation. Make our hearts ready to receive your word for us, that we may go forth from this place ready to joyfully serve you all of our days. Make us into disciples of peace and compassion, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us worship God in song as representatives from the United Choir lead us in singing. Oh, how happy you are. 
to God in the reading of scripture, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, reading the New Revised Standard Version, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Once again, we are going to be blessed with music in preparation for the spoken word. Oh, we 
expressions on each face And I know you feel the presence of the Lord Sweet Holy Spirit Sweet Heavenly Dove Stare right here with us Filling us with your love And for these blessings We lift our hearts in praise Without a doubt we'll know That we have been revived When we shall Extend a warm word of welcome, welcome to all gathered with us today. It is a joy to see each of you in the house of the Lord. Praise God. We want to use as a subject for reflection today, ways to resist the gates of hell. Ways to resist the gates of hell. And of course, our text is from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, and especially verses 16 and 18, if you'll put those verses up for us. And they read as follows, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responded to him, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Let us pray. Speak, O oh God, your word to us. Speak a word that would bless our hearts. Speak so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So this is the first instance of the word church in the Gospels. And if I were to ask you, well, who is the church? Or what is the church? I wonder what your response would be. We are the church. We are the church. Is it Methodists? Is it Pentecostal? Is it Anglican? Your response to those would probably be no, not necessarily. The church, as the Bible understands or the Bible presents, is really the called out 
people of God. People called out of the world by the gospel of Christ. And Jesus is saying, the gates of hell or the gates of Hades, the, the um, King James Version uses the term hell. The gates of Hades will not prevail against this community. Now the power of a city resides in the gates. If an army attacks a city and they take the gates, well, you may as well surrender. If your gates are taken, the city is conquered. It's conquered. Hades is originally the name of the god, common G, who presided over the realm of the dead. Jesus refers here to something that's going to happen to him. He is referring to his impending death. And so these words are both prophetic and contextual. Remember, this is pre-crucifixion. He said, listen, Peter, you just made an amazing solid rock confession. And some stuff going to happen. Some stuff that is aimed at destroying me. Some stuff that perhaps they think they are going to prevent the church. But he's saying, on this rock, now there's, there's great debate in Christian circles about who he was talking to when he said upon this rock. Was he talking to Peter? Or was he saying something else? And I like debate. The thing about debate, you know, is that there is always some truth in one side or the other. Uh, there are always some truth in both sides. I have no problems with debate. But some reputable biblical scholars think that the rock here isn't really referring to Peter. Peter just made a rock solid confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And their belief is that this rock upon which the church was going to be established by Jesus Christ is this rock solid confession that Peter just made. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That is the rock upon which the church would be established. So, Jesus in essence is saying that death will not hold him down. In a similar way, the forces of evil will not hold the church back no matter what. The church is going to establish, and notice he says, I will establish my church. I, Jesus, I will establish my church. Jesus promised it, that this called out people, this community, not a denomination, this community is going to be able to function in such a way that they will even shake down the gates of hell. Every time you are tempted to think that evil has won the day, remember the resurrection of Jesus because he was referring to that. The Pharisees, the scribes, the people who are planning the worst for me, they think they want it. But there's going to be resurrection power that will show otherwise. Every time we are tempted to think that that's the end of it all, remember what Jesus said about the church. That upon the rock of himself, upon the rock solid confession, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, upon that confession, the church is built. But there are some things that we can do to resist the gates of hell. So the church community is the called out people of faith. The people who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it is upon that rock that he will build his church. That confession. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against this community. But there are some simple things that we can do 
to resist the gates of hell. And say, here are some ways of resistance. In the first instance, I want to point out, we have to connect to Christ. We have to connect to Christ. Look at those verses again. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I tell you, Jesus answered, You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But we shake the gates of hell when we connect to Jesus. It is this connection that releases the power to help us shake the gates of hell. It is those people who are connected who will be able to shake the gates of hell. Romans 10, 9 and through 10 tell us how we can connect. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes in the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. This is how we make the connection. And when you are connected like that, you will be able to shake the gates of hell. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Death in all its manifestations shall not prevail against the church. Resurrection is the first and eternal testimonial to this truth. The church shall resist and prevail even from the forces of evil that threaten it. But we must connect to Christ. It is the community that is connected to Christ that will make the difference. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of us have a past. All of us had a, a way of life that was not necessarily Christian. But something happened. Christ touched us. And there's something new in our lives. And this newness is also a symbol of your connection. We are talking about connecting to Christ. The community that shakes the gate of, gates of hell. First must connect to Christ. John 3, 5 to 8. We are talking about connections. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. For what is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born again. The way we enter this community, the way we enter this called out people of God, is to be truly born from above. Now we see these terms water and spirit and sometimes we argue with one another that means you must have a particular type of baptism or that means that hey your baptism has to be done in a certain way now when we speak about the gospel of john as you've heard me say many times it's loaded with symbolism and jesus is talking to nicodemus about a relationship the relationship that is able to shake the gates of hell and water here stands for the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. When we, when we connect to Christ, when we say, Jesus, you are Lord, and when we surrender our lives to him, Jesus cleanses us. And so we are cleansed from past sins, of which all of us is guilty. But if we are cleansed, you may very well proceed to make the same mess of life all over again. The Spirit is the symbol of power. So water and the Spirit stands for the cleansing and the strengthening power of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us of the past and gives us the power, the grace to continue to live for Christ because on our own we can never do it. Water and the Spirit 
stand for the cleansing and the strengthening power of Jesus. And when we are washed and when we are strengthened, we belong to a community that is able to shake the gates of hell. The gates of hell stand for evil and all its representations. So first of all, there are some simple things that we must do. First, we must connect to Christ. Because if you're not connected to Christ, it doesn't necessarily mean you're part of the community. You may play the organ, not showing anything at you, Sister Cena, but that doesn't necessarily mean you belong to the community. You may preach, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you belong to the community. But if you are established upon the rock, on this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is on the basis of that confession of the name of Jesus Christ that you are part of this called out community. Come on, you might be chair of trustees. You say, don't touch that bench unless I tell you to touch it. You may run things around here, but it doesn't mean that you are part of the called out community of God. The called out community is the people or are the people who have declared that Jesus Christ is Lord. They've made that confession and they are connected to Christ. So first we must connect to Christ. But secondly, let me point this out. We must pray for one another. We must pray for one another. You know, the resistance that is happening or the resistance that resists the gates of hell doesn't just happen by accident. A praying church is a powerhouse. And uh, we have personal testimonies about that. But let us first look at a biblical testimony. Acts 12 and verse 5. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. While he was in prison, the church prayed for him. The story goes on to tell that Peter was released from jail as a direct result of a prayer meeting. You know. That's why I'm saying prayer meetings shake the gates of hell. And when we pray for one another, we shake the gates of hell. Let's go on to get a little more background on the story. Acts 12, 11 through 17. Then Peter came to himself and said, No, I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all the Jewish people who were expecting. You see, sometimes people planning your downfall. But the word of God says, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. And so people are expecting to see you sink. But each time you rise and they call you Miss Cork or Mr. Cork, it is because people are praying for you. And God is sustaining you. And the gates of hell are being shaken on your behalf. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. And when he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came out to answer, and recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she didn't even open the gate for him. She went in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. How often have you heard that? When God comes through for you. People tell you you're crazy. That didn't happen. That couldn't happen. You are out of your mind. You're not out of your mind. God is shaking the gates of hell on your behalf. On this rock I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You're out of your mind, they said. 
But she insisted after it was so. They said, it is his angel. They can't believe it. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. They don't let him in yet, you know. And when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. Then he left and went to another place. So that is the biblical example. But let us talk about us. Some of you have been delivered from cancer because people have been praying for you. Some of you have been saved from terrible and perilous situations because the church has been praying for you. Some of us have come through the worst of circumstances because we have a mother or a father who is always on her knees, always on his knees, praying for you. They stop the gates of hell. They shake the gates of hell on your behalf. Some of us have come through situations in which others have died because people have been there praying for you. Prayers that resisted the gates of hell. Because of a group that was praying for you, you came through. Because of family praying for you, you came through. They shook the gates of hell on your behalf. When Christians pray for one another, they connect with God in a powerful way. They resist the gates of hell. And they access a power that cannot be accessed any other way except through prayer. And I would add fasting. But talking about praying for one another, we can't leave out this one as well. One of the ways in which we shake the gates of hell is by respecting one another. The crab in a barrel mentali mentality must never describe the Christian or the Christian church. You know, we are people who love status, you know, the status seeking people. We love to know we are the top. You say to people, you're not in any competition. But come in with a dress that look better than their dress. They say, where you buy that? <laughs> they want to know. Who's in competition? Everybody is happy with their salary until they find out you're making $20,000 more than them. Last week they tell you morning, this week they pass you straight. We love competition. And we like to know that we are on top. We always are not above. And Jesus knew this about the human condition. And in essence, you know what Jesus did? He taught his disciples a lesson. To tell them they must respect each other to the point where they are serving each other. And to the point where they are washing one another's feet. You know, I'm not making this up, you know. John 13, 12 through 14. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's a compelling lesson. When we 
Learn to respect each other. Respect one another. To the point where we are willing to wash one another's feet. We shake the gates of hell. Jesus taught that that is the kind of service we must do. And Jesus demonstrated this in his washing the disciples' feet. And his lessons came home powerfully in the example to teach us that dominance over one another is not the way of Christ. Dominance over one another is not the way of this called out community. You must be willing to wash one another's feet. And Paul, in Romans 12, puts the same concept beautifully in verse 10, I believe, and he says, love one another with mutual affection. Love one another with mutual affection. And here's the competition he talks about. Outdo one another in showing honor. Here's the competition he recommends. Outdo one another in showing honor. So honor where honor is due. Respect where respect is due. Respect for others means that you will exercise self-control. And self-control means that you are not giving precedence to one over the other. Where there is respect, mutual respect, the gates of hell are resisted. We're talking about ways to resist the gates of hell. So let me say this finally. Finally. Support one another. Support one another. We're talking about the church, the called out community. And we said, first of all, to be this community that is able to resist the gates of hell, we must first connect to Christ because it is on this rock that the church is built. And we said, secondly, we need to pray for one another. That includes respecting one another. And we're saying, finally, we have to support one another. One is important, but community is stronger. God is one, but God is so community-oriented that God functions in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are called into community because community makes us stronger. It is the church, the called out community, that shakes the gates of hell. Community provides the context for growth and healing. A lone wolf faces far greater danger than a pack. A community of Christians is far more powerful than one. The gates of Hades cannot prevail against a congregation of loving, supportive, praying Christians. And you know how Paul tells us that we can support one another? Galatians 6 and verse 10. He says, so then, ever, so then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Because when you do this, you shake the gates of hell. If you are in a position to help, a sister or brother in need, and you don't do it, how does that shake down the enemy who is evil and the devil? It is when you lend a helping hand. It is when a brother is down or a sister is down and you lift him up. It is in doing so that you shake the gates of hell. And Romans 12 
15 through 16, where Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. And here's the hard part. We have real problems with this. Live in harmony with one another. That is a tough piece. Live in harmony with one another. Would you put that text back up there? Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do this, and you will shake the gates of hell. So when we connect to Christ, and when we pray for one another, and when we support one another, we are accessing a power that makes hell tremble. I close with an illustration that I pull from my book of illustrations. It says, in the midst of a storm, a little bird was clinging to the limb of a tree. Seeming calm and unafraid. In the middle of a storm, you know. As the wind tore at the limbs of the tree, the bird continued to look the storm in the face as if to say, shake me off, I still have wings. Shake me off, I still have wings. Because of Christ's resurrection, each Christian can look the experience of death or adversity in the face and confidently say, shake me off, I still have wings, I live anyway. Be hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give God a praise, I want to talk about it. I will live anyway. Because you're part of the community that Christ speaks of will be hell shakers. Upon this rock, I build my church. Upon the solid rock of the confession that Peter just made. And so the interpretation we're taking today, notwithstanding the debate on the text, is that the rock of which Christ spoke is not necessarily the foundational work of Peter in establishing the church, although there's some truth to that too. But more so, it is the solid rock confession that Peter made. Upon this rock, that Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the way we shake down hell, put that conclusion up for us again, please, brother. The way we shake down hell is to connect to this Christ. And the way we shake down hell is to pray for one another. The way we shake down hell is to respect one another. And the way we shake down hell is to support one another. And then we will be the community that is established upon the rock. The gates of hell can't prevail against a community like that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us be in prayer. Eternal God, we praise your holy name. We come to you now, Lord. We come in this moment just to surrender ourselves, for we know that in order to be part of the community, we must surrender to you. So even at this time, we know that you are Lord. Search our hearts. As the psalmist says, search us and know us. And we lay our lives bare before you. 
Your word says if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to be part of that community that shake the gates of hell. Take us and use us for your purpose to reduce the presence of evil in the world and to honor Christ and shake the gates of hell. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand for the great thanksgiving as we prepare ourselves for the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be a sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please be seated. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant put out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Watch your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. I invite you to take the sanitizer in your pews and just do the ritual of sanitizing your hands. I hear there's a 20 second rule, so you rub your hands for about 20 seconds. And I invite you to take the communion elements that is provided and take off the first layer that will expose the wafer and together we eat the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you and for me preserve us to eternal life we take and eat in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for us and we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving Expose the wine, in our case, grape juice. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed 
for us, preserve us to eternal life. We take and drink in remembrance of Christ's blood was shed for us, and we are thankful. Let us together say that prayer that is printed beginning eternal God. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we listen to musical selection from representatives of the United Choir.
that happened to me. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're the best thing that happened to me. Give God thanks for the United Choir for faithfully serving us in our 11 o'clock service all through the pandemic. And even as we try to get back to normal, they, we're still observing COVID protocol in this church. Thank God we've been through an entire year. We haven't had one case, and we thank God for that. So we aren't relaxing too soon. We just want to keep the protocol as is. So as you leave, we ask that you leave through this door. That's our protocol we've been observing. And Put your offering in the box at the back. But after I do the offering prayer um, and the benediction and we are off camera, I'm asking you to remain for about five minutes so that we share some announcements. We don't want to do our announcements on camera. So let's stand for the blessing of the offering. Heavenly Father, Thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and our every need. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with all the fullness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go now in peace. Knowing the miracles that God has produced in your life, be assured that there are still more miracles to come. Be a witness to God's love to all you meet. Go forth in the name of Jesus Christ to shake the gates of hell. In the name of the Creator, the Holy One who resides with you always, go in peace. Amen. So please take your seats briefly on your way out. You'll put your offering in the box 